Hey everybody, it's You Had to Ask, the show where I answer your questions, and this week, my first question comes from Terry Williams, who says, One of the first videos I watched of yours was a video where, instead of The Matrix, you recommended Dark City. I love Dark City, and it outclasses The Matrix any day, but I watched a recent video where you went off on David Goyer for the shit he said about She-Hulk, rightfully so, by the way. He co-wrote Dark City, which I'm sure you knew. Does it take away from enjoying Dark City even just a little to know he was a part of it, knowing what we know now? Good question. And someone else, uh, Mick J, replied to Terry's comment and asked a question related to that, which is, how do I reconcile enjoying someone's work enjoying an artist's work when I know that that artist has a, a religion or a philosophy or something that is opposed to to me, to something that I believe. Um, knowing that Goyer had something to do with uh, Dark City doesn't diminish my enjoyment of it at all. I, I've mentioned before in these videos, I'm pretty good at compartmentalizing. And just because David Goyer is seems like he's kind of an asshole, and because I generally also regard him as a hack, <laughs> as a writer, Dark City is still a great accomplishment, and he deserves credit for whatever his contributions were in writing that film. And I, it, the fact that David Goyer has his fingerprints on it and has his name on it doesn't diminish my enjoyment of it at all. It's a terrific movie. It's one of my favorite movies of the last 15 or 20 years, and I just, I really, really love it. Um, how do I reconcile uh, liking... Uh, the work of an artist whose beliefs or views, whatever, that I disagree with. Again, I think it's just compartmentalization. It's knowing that it's the work that matters. It's the work <laughs> that I am responding to, not the person. Because I don't know the person. You know, like, I don't know David Goyer personally. Maybe if I got to know him, maybe I would start to think he was a nice guy. I don't see that based on his work. Because what he puts out there in terms of his personality and in terms of his writing makes me think that he makes me think poorly of him. But who knows? Maybe in real life he's a nice guy. I don't know. There's the work and then there's the person. And I respond to the work because I don't know the person. The work is all I have to respond to. And I judge the work based on how I feel about it, not how I feel about the person who made it. Old Comic One. Steve, what do you think of the name Redskins for the Washington team? I hate it. Do you think it should be changed? Yes. <laughs> yes, I think it should be changed. I have no doubt, I am not conflicted about this at all. The name should be changed. Should the team be forced to change it? I'm not so sure about that. I don't think they should be forced to change it. Uh, it's a private team, but uh, I think that they should want to change it. I don't get how Dan, why Dan Snyder, the owner of the team, is digging his heels in so stubbornly about this. If I were the owner of that team, I, I couldn't wait to change that name. I don't get how people are not embarrassed by it. And the, the fact that there's such a groundswell of people who insist the name must not be changed. I mean, what if, uh, substitute another racial slur, right, for that name. Instead of the Redskins, what if they were called the Coons or the Kikes? or the Polacks, or I mean, it just, it, it doesn't work. It's not appropriate. We have grown as a culture, most of us, beyond that time period where it was acceptable for a major sports franchise to be named for a derogatory term for a particular group of people. Of course it should be changed. They should not be the Redskins. They should be anything else. And you know what? Uh, if and when they do change the name, in five years, Nobody will even give a shit. Everybody treats it like if, oh, if they change the name of the Redskins with all those decades of heritage, blah, 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 it's going like to be catastrophic. Like, like, like anything in the world is going to change based on the fucking Redskins changing their name. They'll name them something else. In five years, everybody will be used to the new name, just like people used to think of the Baltimore NFL team as the Colts from back in the day. Then they got the new franchise. They named them the Ravens. Nobody even fucking thinks about the Colts anymore. It's the Ravens. The Ravens is the Baltimore football team now, not the Colts. People are used to it. If they change the name of the Redskins to something else, then they'll be that. They won't be the Redskins. They'll be whatever they are now. Just like with the Washington Bullets. They changed the name of the Washington Bullets because of all the crime in Washington. They thought having an NBA team named the Bullets in a, a city with such a high crime rate was inappropriate, so they changed them from the Bullets to the Wizards. Nobody even, when you're watching a game now, you don't even think that they used to be called the Bullets. 
uh, it's the same thing what happened to the Redskins, and that's what they should do. They should have done it 10 years ago. They should have done it 30 years ago when people started first complaining about this. Uh, it boggles my mind how they're so stubborn about this. Change the fucking name. Vadim Cream, hey Steve, there is a storytelling trope that has existed in modern entertainment that should be pretty irritating to atheists and skeptics alike. It's the convention of a skeptical character who learns that some otherworldly thing that they fiercely believed could not exist does indeed exist. A classic example would be the Scully character in the X-Files, also Rust in the recent True Detective. In the end, their skepticism is usually seen as a hindrance and they are rewarded for overcoming it. Here's the thing that really annoys me about this convention. I think it works and can be very gratifying. We just about all have blind spots, truths about the world and ourselves that are difficult to accept, but through their acceptance we become stronger people. I think the storytelling trope I mentioned is an allegorical means of teaching us or preparing us to do this, so these sorts of stories are valuable. The usefulness of this is a double-edged sword, though, because an unfortunate consequence of this type of story is that it makes skeptics look unwise, as though we're overly cynical about the world around us. Overall, it pretty much makes us look like assholes, and I imagine it contributes to people's negative views towards skepticism as a whole. Thoughts? I agree with pretty much everything you just said. I would only quibble slightly as an X-Files fan that I appreciated the many times when in an X-Files episode, even though the unbelievable thing would turn out to exist, there would also turn out to be a rational scientific explanation for it. And often, because it was the X-Files and it was a fantasy show, the, the explanation itself would be pretty far-fetched, you know. But if Mulder and Scully were investigating you know, some sort of a mutant monster type of thing, it would be the result of like a genetic mutation. or there, there would be a scientific explanation for it rather than a supernatural explanation. These stories are useful for the reasons you described and they work because, one of the reasons they work is because uh, we like to see characters that change. When you take writing classes that you're, you're taught about character arcs and how your protagonist should begin at one point in the story and through the events that he or she experiences through the story should end up at point B. And point B is not a different physical location, it's a different state of mind, it's a different type of character, it's, it's a change, a learning experience, something that has caused the character to grow and evolve as a person. They've learned a lesson, they've become wiser, they've uh, survived some kind of ordeal that has made them appreciate things more. There's been a, 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 a change in the character. And that change from skeptic to believer is a really easy change to take a character through. It's a very comfortable character arc to take your character through. And it's something that most people in the audience have experienced in one way or another. Because as you say in your question, uh, we all have blind spots and we all have moments in our lives when we have to accept something that we maybe don't want to accept or we are shown something to be true that we thought would never be true so it's it's a universal theme in a way and it's and it's a really easy reliable story to tell it's a, it's a sturdy formula but um it would be nice if there were more stories where the skeptical character went through a character arc that didn't involve he or she uh, coming to embrace faith, uh, there's there are someone left a someone replied to your question, Vadim, and left a comment uh, pointing out how often th this trope results in a character having to uh, discover the value of faith. Occasionally, you can even catch like Star Trek doing that which is really irritating because you're like, no, dude, the, your whole stupid show is about the future <laughs> and the future brought to us by science and reason and letting go of, of our petty conflicts and our, our irrationality and our superstitions. And we have this great paradise now. And oh, yeah, but, you know, sometimes it helps to just be a little superstitious, you know, or be be a little wooey. It's 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 it is really irritating. Um, but, yeah, you're right. Those those that trope in those conventions will probably always be with us in fiction and whether we like them or not as skeptics the reason that they're there is because they work as 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 storytelling tools here's one from this is 3d another question for you mr shives do you think it is possible to be too skeptical or overzealous with skepticism 
When I was a high schooler, I began accepting a number of conspiracy theories like 9-11, the moon landing, and JFK. I eventually took a better look at these and the facts and changed my mind, but at the time I thought I was being skeptical. It might have just been an anti-government mentality due to my outstanding hatred for the Bush administration. Also, how do we best approach people who aren't being skeptical because the facts need to be examined and evaluated, but because the facts conflict with their own personal bias? Thanks. Sure, it's possible to be too skeptical. I, mean, I think when you get to that point, I don't know if it's fair to call whatever you are doing skepticism. But, but yeah, I mean, people, you have to remember that, that being a skeptic doesn't mean that you reject all claims unless you can personally examine compelling evidence. I think it just means that you need to be convinced about claims that strike you as extraordinary or outrageous or unusual that, or, you know, needing additional evidence before you believe them, before you accept them. Um, if you ever get to the point where you have lost the distinction between a, kind of an ordinary everyday claim and an extraordinary claim that ought to be substantiated with additional evidence, then you have become too skeptical. You know, if someone makes an extraordinary claim to you, if they say, I raised someone from the dead the other day, you're not being too skeptical by asking for more evidence before you believe that, and by doubting that until you get such evidence. But if someone says, oh, hey, I stopped by McDonald's yesterday morning and I was hoping I could get an Egg McMuffin, but I couldn't get it because they were all out of Egg McMuffins. Now, that is very unusual. You don't usually hear about McDonald's running out of Egg McMuffins, but it's not the sort of thing that you would launch an investigation over because there's nothing that impossible about it. It's just one of those things, you know. If someone, tells, if someone told me that, I would go, oh, shit, really? That sucks. And then I would go on with my day. I wouldn't be skeptical about that claim. Um... The conspiracy theory thing is interesting because a lot of conspiracy theorists fancy themselves, as you did, as being skeptical, and that's why they accept whatever their pet conspiracy theory is and not the official version, because they fancy themselves as being more skeptical than the people who accept the official version. But actually, what they've done by accepting the conspiracy theory, and they're usually blinded by their own bias to this, but what they've actually done is accepted a far more ludicrous claim than the official explanation of whatever this phenomenon is on the basis of far less evidence. They've actually done something even less skeptical <laughs> than they would have done had they been convinced by the official story. You know, you can, it, it, make, it, it might make you feel smarter than other people to say, well, you know, he never really landed on the moon because it's contrarian and it, it cuts against the popular consensus and the scientific evidence. Uh, but you can't say you're being skeptical when you do that because you're accepting a very, very extraordinary claim on the basis of nothing and you're rejecting a, a well-accepted, well-established claim. So you're, not, you're being the opposite of skeptical. You're being gullible. You're being credulous. You're being the very thing that you uh, look down on the non-conspiracy theorists for. You know, so it's, it's, and it, it, it is definitely about bias. That bias is what keeps people from seeing that, I think. Uh, as you mentioned in your question, your, your anti-George Bush, anti-government bias kept you from realizing that conspiracy theories were kind of horseshit before you eventually did. Um, as for how you get through that bias, how you can convince someone who is not being skeptical due to such a bias to be more skeptical and to see things from the other side, I mean, other than explaining things as you see them, and, and explaining how you got to your conclusion, there's really nothing you can do. Sometimes people have such a strong personal bias uh, that it's difficult to break through. And at that, and I think part of it is realizing when it stops being your job to break through that person's bias. You know, if a person is a conspiracy theorist and they swear up and down that 9-11 was an inside job and you've explained to them why you think it wasn't an inside job over and over again and you've done it several different ways and you've used you know, metaphors, and you've argued by analogy, and you've pointed out specific evidence, and you've done everything you possibly can, and you can't convince them that 9-11 wasn't an inside job. At some point, you just have to accept that it is not your job to change this person's mind. Reltzik. Hey, Steve. Hero battle question. 
the terms of the battle, an old-fashioned MacGuffin race, in which both heroes must compete to follow a series of clues around the globe, retrieve the MacGuffin, and return it to their employers for victory. Along the way, they have a series of increasingly sharp and potentially lethal encounters, eventually culminating in a final showdown with the MacGuffin or its location as the prize. A gentlemanly team-up with them sharing the prize is not allowed. Victory is determined by final possession of the MacGuffin, so if one brings it home and then the other steals it after it's locked away, the thief wins unless his opponent can recover it. The competitors, Indiana Jones versus Connery's Bond. Both are in their prime, ignore that they're a couple of decades apart, and both have their typical array of equipment, contacts, sidekicks, and support mechanisms. Who would win, and also, who would get the girl? Indy is better suited to this challenge, I think, especially if it involves following clues and uh, puzzle solving and trying to recover an item. Uh, but I think that Connery's Bond would win in the end, because I feel like uh, he would be smart enough to know his limitations, to know what he is capable of and what he is not capable of. And while I think that Connery's Bond would be better than Indy at the surviving lethal encounters bit <laughs> and killing people he needed to kill in order to get where he needed to go, I think the, the, the globe-trotting, clue-searching, puzzle-solving bit would be right up Indy's alley. So I think that Connery's Bond would allow Indy to get to where he needed to go, or at least almost where he needed to go, and then Connery's Bond would either swoop in just ahead of Indy and grab the MacGuffin for himself, or would do as you suggested and steal it from him after Indy has gotten it. Uh, so I would bet on Connery's Bond in, in that scenario. But I would also like to have Indy get the girl to subvert that trope, so that they can kind of uh, uh, end up with sort of a tie. You know, Connery's Bond gets the MacGuffin that Indy has been chasing, but instead of James Bond getting the girl... Indy gets the girl to sort of turn that convention on its head, even though and Indy usually gets the girl too. They both have that they always get the girl thing, but James Bond is more known as a womanizer and as the guy who gets the girl, so that's how I would do it. Bond steals the MacGuffin from Indy and wins that competition, but Indy gets the girl. Joe Tuccini, I just realized your channel isn't called Steve Likes to Curse anymore. Do you still like to curse? Shit yes, Joe, you bet your fucking ass I like to curse. <laughs> you see what I did there? I answered it by cursing. Um, yeah, I still like to curse. If I ever stop liking to curse, if I ever get to the point where I'm watching my language too much, because a lot of times I just don't curse because I don't curse, because I just don't feel the need to or it just doesn't occur to me, and I don't want to curse gratuitously. That's not cool. But if I ever reach the point where I'm like consciously choosing not to curse on my own fucking YouTube channel then may God strike me dead. <laughs> and we all know that that's... Like, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for all of it, oh God. <laughs> Again, that wasn't God. Because there is no God. It means that it's time for... The Lightning Round. Rapid fire questions. Glib and adequate answers. Dangerously talented, someone on the other side of the planet has just challenged you to dump a bucket of ice water on your head for charity. What do you do? What do you do? I donate money to the ALS Association, which I did earlier this week. So, no ice bucket for me, man. You think I'm going to dump a bucket of ice water on this head? <laughs> I don't think so, my friend. <laughs> they got their money. Der Wunderbar Bar. Which version of Blade Runner do you prefer? The theatrical release with the narration or the final cut? Before, I would have chosen the narrated version, but I have come to appreciate the darker quality of the final cut, especially the way the fate of Rachel is left open-ended in the final cut. Pardon me a moment. Ah. Um, I prefer the final cut, too, mostly for the lack of narration. I'll be honest, the, taking the narration out really makes a big difference to me because unnecessary voiceover narration is a big pet peeve of mine. I, I, I am hard-pressed to think of a movie that, would, that has it that would not have been better without it. Maybe Sin City because it just is so ingrained in it and it's so ever present that it would be hard to just take it out it would it would radically alter the film but in most cases where there's voiceover narration on a movie i would say the first improvement i would suggest is fucking get rid of it
So yeah, I, I prefer the, the final cut for that reason and for other reasons as well. Observable fiction. Hey Steve, just curious. Every now and again I hear you call something offensive. I'm just wondering why you do that. You surely hold opinions that are offensive to a lot of people, as I do. Why does it matter enough to be worth even mentioning? Well, uh, saying that something is offensive is just a way of saying how you feel about it. I mean, I don't see why there's anything unusual, why, why I should consider not saying that I think something is offensive if I think it's offensive, just like if I think that something is funny. I don't think, well, I shouldn't say that I think it's funny. I mean, after all, that's just my opinion. You know, it's, it's, it's just a way of expressing how I feel about things, which, if you haven't noticed, is kind of the only thing I do on this YouTube channel. Uh, Creighton Reed, Steve, who is your favorite stand-up comedian of all time, dead or alive, and your least favorite stand-up comedian, dead or alive? Oh, favorite, probably Carlin, uh, maybe Pryor, but probably Carlin would be my favorite, and least favorite, Dane Cook, easy. I don't think he's funny, I don't get it, I, 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 I do not understand his success. Benjamin Snyder, Greg Gutfeld in the Red Eye Lightning Round sound, and you, who made that sound first? I mean no harm, I didn't hear the question answered the first time. If it was already answered, both sound very similar. Ben. Well, Red Eye, that show has been on for a lot longer than I've been doing this series, so I would assume that Red Eye did it first. Uh, but I don't know, I don't watch Red Eye because I cannot stand Greg Gutfeld. I don't think he's funny. I, I, I find him intolerable and unwatchable, so I don't know. But I would assume if they do that, if they do a lightning round gimmick on Red Eye and they have a, like a thunderclap sound effect that they did it first. But I didn't steal it from him because I never watched that fucking horrible show. ZJ Donnan, what are some of your favorite comfort films, movies you watch to get out of a bad mood? Uh, Star Trek is reliable for that for me. Superman, Christopher Reeve Superman, uh, and Superman Returns as well. Uh, that's a good one. Or, or, or like cheesy bad movies, like, you know, Roadhouse or The Karate Kid or, you know, some like really like cheesy, campy, bad fucking movie. Th those are my comfort films when I'm kind of in a shitty mood or I want to cheer myself up. I watch something like that. Uh, and a lot of Star Trek qualifies as that too, so it's good. Uh, Jason Brene, how's it going, Steve? Are you well? You feel okay? How's life? What can I do for you? How can I help you, you know? <sighs> Thank you. Thank you for paying that off. Mead Hands. Steve, your shoutouts are heavily in favor of religious, philosophical, and scientific channels. Are there any other types of YouTube channels that you really dig? Are you an unboxer kind of guy? Are you sitting on a hidden collection of haul videos? Do you have a huge playlist of makeup tutorials? Maybe you're a big Let's Play lover. Tell us your secrets. Uh, I don't like any of those kinds of videos, and I, I am baffled that other people do. It's something that I just, it's one of those, the many things in life and one of the many things about the internet and, and YouTube culture that I just don't get. What the fuck is so entertaining about watching someone else play a video game? I don't, I don't understand. And I know those videos are hugely popular and I know a lot of you guys probably watch them and enjoy them and I don't begrudge you that. I'm just saying I don't get it. Or watching someone, well, watching someone, you know, show you what they got at the mall just now. Or, or you know, take, like, their new PlayStation out of the box and show it. Like, wh why do I fucking care? <laughs> I mean, if you make a video like that and you get, like, 100,000 views and, and it's, I mean, good for you. But I don't get it. I just don't get it. Uh, McFly88. Steve, why do you answer so many of Radical Bacon's questions? And does your wife know about you, too? Yeah, well, I didn't answer any of Radical Bacon's question this time, did I, smartass? And no, my wife doesn't know, so I would appreciate it if you would keep that on the QT, okay? Thanks, pal. Jeff Edberg, hey, Steve, besides your own, of course, what YouTube channel run by an atheist is your favorite? Oh, man. I mean, I love uh, The Thinking Atheist, Seth Andrews. I love Dark Matter 2525. Um, I love Jason with a D. I, he and I do some stuff together every now and then. And we make videos, too. Uh, <laughs> we do the, the late-seating movie reviews. Uh, we have been doing them as uh, 
Google Hangout shows, but I think we're going to transition into doing them as a podcast. But we do those like every other week, and I, I love working with him, and his Opinionville is fucking awesome. If you're not watching Jason with the D's channel and Opinionville, I don't know what you're doing with your life. You should be watching that channel. Um, and uh, Bob Smearfack is incredible. Bob Smearfack and Bob's Notes. I've given both of these guys shout-outs in the past, so just consider this like a re-up for both of their shout-outs because they're both awesome, and their content is amazing, and they're funny, and they're great writers, and they're great presenters, and... Yeah, uh, Jason with a D and Bob Smearfack of, of of the guys that are more sort of on my own level. I mean, Dark Matter and uh, Seth are kind of a little bit over my head in terms of popularity and everything. But uh, yeah, those guys are amazing. And there's a long, long list. Too. I mean, The Bible Reloaded, those guys are fucking great, too. You know, uh, it, yeah, I don't know. I can't really pick a favorite. But of the ones I just mentioned, kind of grab one of those if you're interested. Um, hey, that's it for the questions, everybody. Before I get out of here, speaking of uh, shout-outs, I'm going to give a shout-out to someone I've never given a shout-out to before, which is what I like to do around this time of the show every week. Um, the shout-out this week goes to Chris Shelton. Chris is a former Scientologist, and his videos pertain to Scientology and to his own personal uh, emergence from Scientology and his transition from a Scientologist to more of a skeptic rationalist point of view. Uh, really interesting videos. If you're interested in Scientology, if you ever get sick of hearing atheists or skeptics talk about, you know, Christianity or Islam or one of you know, the, the major Abrahamic faiths, it's, it's, it's nice to sort of take a break every once in a while and see the principles of the scientific method and, and reason applied to another type of religion. And Scientology is one of those modern faiths that we actually have the luxury of knowing for a fact that it's made up. <laughs> Scientology's origins are not shrouded in the mysteries of the past. It wasn't founded by mysterious anonymous men thousands of years ago. We know exactly who made it up and when he made it up and why. It was just invented by some dude in the 50s. We know that. We know that Scientology is just made up bullshit. Uh, and Chris is very candid and very sharp and very smart about talking about his own experiences as a Scientologist and what made him sort of come out of that background, how he uh, discovered and embraced science and reason. And, and uh, it's great for both the experience, hearing about the experience of someone who was a Scientologist, and also uh, as a, it's, he makes videos that are wonderful, very entertaining and uh, enlightening critiques of Scientology of the Scientology teachings and of Scientologist culture. It's just a really, really informative, great, uh, skeptical on Scientology channel. So Chris Shelton, uh, check out his channel. It's well, well worth your time. Well, that's it for this week. Next week, I have a little bit of a milestone coming up. As, as uh, some of you have been commenting for the last couple weeks in anticipation, next week is episode number 100 of uh, this series of You Had to Ask. And you've been asking, do I have anything special planned? I mean, I don't really, but I'm going to do something a little different because it's episode 100 to sort of mark the milestone. So when you leave a comment on this video to ask me your question for next time, which I ask you to do as always, you can leave a question for me to answer if you want, as, as you usually do. I will answer as many of them as I can. Or you can also ask a question for any of the characters who have appeared in any of my Steve and Stuffy videos. You can ask a question of Stuffy, you can ask a question of Toby Benson, you can ask a question of Jack McPherson, of Millicent, of Hans Krieger, you could even ask a question of Prospector Jones, who debuted on this week's Steve and Stuffy video. Anybody who has ever appeared in a Steve and Stuffy video, you can ask any of them a question about anything you'd like to know about them. They will appear in person and they will answer their questions. Speaking of Jason with a D, <laughs> we're going to opinionville this bitch. We're going to have some, some uh, you had to ask version of intimate questions. Uh, but I don't have puppets. I have stuffed animals. Uh, so it's different. So no lawsuits, Jason, please. Uh, yeah, so that'll be next week. So for, for episode 100 only, a very special uh, feature. Ask me a question or ask Stuffy or one of the gang a question. We will all answer as many of them as we possibly can next week. It'll be a lot of fun and slightly more work for me, but that's okay. It's, it's, it's a special day. It's a milestone. So thank you guys, as always, for watching. I appreciate it. Ask me or any of the Stuffy gang your questions for next time. Leave a comment on this video and leave your question for next time. Ask any of us anything about anything. Nothing is too serious. Nothing is too silly. Clearly. 
and we will answer as many of them as we possibly can in the next video. So until then, take care, everybody. I'll see you next time.